Where does expected value come from? In this video, I'm going to show you how to think ahead so you can get ahead in poker. Hey everyone, before we start the video, we'd really appreciate it if you could hit the like and subscribe buttons. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you and enjoy the video. So where does expected value come from? This is the most important question you can ask yourself in poker. If you don't understand how your hand makes money, then how do you expect to make money with your hand, <laughs> right? It's a very simple yet deceivingly complex question and we're gonna tackle it today. So first of all, why is this important? Well, consider this. The expected value of early street actions depends heavily on how you play future streets. That is to say, you know, maybe it's a, an indifferent preflop decision, but if you're butchering it on turn and river, well, it's no longer a zero EV call, now is it? Future mistakes may well cost you more value than the recommended earlier street action is predicted to earn you in theory, right? Like, some hands, you're expected to find these counterintuitive bluffs or very thin calls or thin value bets, plays that you might have trouble finding. But if you don't find those plays, then are these hands actually going to pay off as much as the solver says they will? For more information about this, I recommend reading this counterintuitive calls article by Andrew Brokos. It's fantastic. Link in the description. This has inspired my video today. So we'll start with a simple outline. First of all, we've chatted about why this is important. Now we're going to look at red line versus blue line analysis. And then I'll show you a few simple techniques. I'm going to use a combination of runout analysis as well as just some basic look ahead techniques to show you how you can think about where your hand's value actually comes from. Expected value in poker can be categorized as coming from one of two sources. Blue line, which is money won or lost at showdown, or red line, which is money won or lost before showdown. Those are the only two ways to win at poker, right? So which of these two is more important? Should you be a blue line nit or a red line maniac? Well, ultimately it's the green line that matters, but this has been a common question since, well, since HUDs came, have come out. So let's try and give it a definitive answer today. We're gonna start with a baseline. Six GTO bots play a rakeless cash game for millions and millions of hands. They're all rotating seats, they all play the same strategy. So what's the end result? If you take a look at any one of their graphs, would their blue line be higher than the red line? Would the red line be higher than the blue line? Or would the lines be the same? Take a moment to consider your answer. Surprisingly, the answer is A. The blue line would be higher than the red line. Why is this? Well, the answer is that it's a multi-way game. There are six of them playing in a six max game. If this were heads up, these two lines would be the same because, well, they're playing the same strategy. But multi-way is not quite the same as heads up, now is it? Let's take a look at this graph. This was sent in by my dear colleague, Matt Roberts. What he did is he ran just an ungodly amount of Pio Sims, and then using custom code, he exported those hands into hand to note which is a hand tracker, and showed what the win rate for a GTO bot would be playing against other GTO bots. And as you can see, the blue line, the money one at showdown, is much greater than the red line. You'll also notice a few other things about this graph. One is that it's not quite at zero. I think this is because there's a little bit of rake included. The other is that it's, it's very patchy, and this is because the sims were run as reports and then shipped out in batches. But it's very interesting to see just how much more the blue line is than the red line. Now, let's ask some simple questions. Showdown versus non-showdown winnings. We need to ask how one can transfer from one to the other. Now, blue line cannot be transferred to red line without mistakes. However, red line can be transferred to blue line without mistakes. And this is the key difference. Any two set of strategies, as long as everybody at the table is playing the same strategy, it doesn't even have to be GTO, the blue line should always be higher than the red line, unless you're playing, you know, some absurd rake structure. And this, for the simple fact that you're going to steal the blinds a lot, right? So, for example, button opens, small blind folds, big blind calls. The button and the big blind go to showdown, and the button wins at showdown. We have just provided a very simple and very common path for the red line to go to the blue line. Multi-way pots allow this transfer from red to blue very simply. However, there is no path from blue to red unless some player is making a mistake, unless players are playing different strategies. Uh, there's no way to go from blue to red. 
not when you average it out over the long term. That is to say, playing the same strategy in every spot and every position. There's no way to go from blue to red, but there is a way to go from red to blue, just due to multi-weight dynamics. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Well, we now know that in a GTO solution, in a multi-way game, GTO bots will have a blue line win rate, right? Most of their winnings will come from showdown value. And this is just due to the fact that the blinds cost them a lot of money to keep folding, right? This is to be expected. Now, does this mean that everyone should be a blue line player? Absolutely not. No, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. There are plenty of crushers out there who are red line winners. These are guys that they take it down in a lot of spots. They pick their spots wisely. They know when the population's over or under bluffing. There's plenty of red line warriors out there. And similarly, there's plenty of very strong blue line players out there. I think most people playing micro to low stakes, pretty much all the winners at that stake are going to have a very high blue line. The reason I'm telling you this is because we need a baseline from which to adjust from. If you're playing six max poker and you see a red line player, they're typically doing something special because this doesn't occur if everyone's playing the same strategy, right? All right, let's set aside the theoretical implications of red versus blue line. It's a really interesting topic, but it's not what I want to focus on today. I want to give you more practical advice. In general, we want to know where EV comes from. And to do this, you must examine future streets. Can't understand how your hand derives money unless you look ahead. And I'm going to show you a few simple techniques for looking ahead to understand where that EV comes from. I'm going to teach you a simple technique you can use to visualize how your hand makes money. Step one, choose one hand to focus on. Step two is to graph that hand's expected value across different turn cards. Step three is to compare how the expected value of that hand changes across different turns to how the strategy changes. So what turns does our hand make the most money and what turns are we being the most aggressive? And you'll find that those two do not always coincide. Lastly, we're going to investigate rivers whenever we run into something kind of weird or counterintuitive. So the purpose of this method is to start on the flop and look ahead to future streets in order to understand where our value comes from. All right, that's enough talk. It'll become more clear with an example. Let's open GTO Wizard and see how the solver applies these concepts. For the first example, I've chosen a button versus big blind king 8 5 2 tone flop. Checks to us on the button, and we have a fairly mixed strategy here. So again, the way this works is we're going to focus on one particular hand. And the hands I want to focus on are 3-3. Three, three. What sticks out to me about 3-3 three, three are that we're betting 3-3 three, three with a club, not so much without a club. Now, why is that? It, could it be because we block flush draws? Or potentially, maybe we have cleaner outs. Maybe it's because we can hit a club turn, and then we have a chance to hit a backdoor flush draw. Well, let's find out which of these factors actually matters. We'll start with the blocker hypothesis. You go to the ranges tab, you can see how many combinations each player has. We're looking at 500 combinations in the buttons range, 350 in the big blinds. The ranges are far too wide here for these blocker effects to have any real meaning. You block maybe six combinations of flush draws, it really doesn't matter at this point. Ranges are too wide, right? Maybe it becomes important later. Probably not that much. Blockers matter when ranges are tight because then they have the most effect in terms of card removal. When ranges are wide, blockers don't matter that much. Okay, so if it's not blockers, maybe it's to do with how our hand hits turns and rivers. Backdoor flush draws or cleaner outs, for example. So the way to test this is we're going to get called, and open up turn reports. So here I'm just going to select reports, and we're going to apply a filter. Okay? I'm going to select three of clubs, three of diamonds. And I want to look at the button's expected value with three of clubs, three of diamonds. So you can look at one player, the other, or both at the same time. I'm just going to look at button. And you know what, let's just go ahead and sort this by highest EV to lowest EV. So here on, on the left-hand side, I'm looking at the expected value of button when they hold pocket threes across all of these different turn cards. And obviously, you know, hitting that beautiful, beautiful two-outer is going to be the highest EV, followed only by hitting a backdoor flush draw. So here's the thing. What happens if instead of three of clubs, we have, for example, let's say three of hearts, three of diamonds. So we don't have that club anymore. No more backdoor flush draws, 
Uh, well, let's see what happens. We'll notice the most interesting change is, well, first of all, these clubs are now very bad for us. But second of all, look at what happens to our two major outs. 3-3. Three, three. We just lost half our value on the three of clubs turn. I know it's weird to think of a pocket pair as a draw, but realistically, an enormous chunk of your value with this hand just comes from hitting that two outer, right? So when one of our outs is poisoned, in this case, hitting our set also completes our opponent's flush draws, that's going to severely detract from how much value we can get from this. And so that's why if we go back to the flop, you can see why the solver is more inclined to build a pot with the types of hands that when they actually hit a big hand can play for stacks, right? Let's do something else here. I'm going to change this to horizontal view. And all this does is it shows each combination separately. And I'm going to focus on, in particular, pocket pairs. So I want to look at these low pairs, maybe these under pairs, maybe some of these third pairs. So let's take a look at some of these. Now, you may be a little confused as to how to read this. The combinations in red here on the right-hand side, these have a club. They're shown down here. Left-hand side do not have a club. So we'll notice that all of these pocket pairs seem to prefer to bet with a club. And it's the same heuristic, right? Some of them have more or less blocker properties. Some of them have stronger backdoor flush draws. But the analysis is the same. The biggest reason by far is just that you have cleaner outs to a set. The second biggest reason is having a backdoor flush draw. Now, how much this impacts you is largely dependent on how deep stacked you are. If you're 200 big blinds deep, well, the backdoor flush draw equity might actually become more valuable. Not by itself, but in aggregate across all turns. Anyway, that's just a simple example of how you can use simple runout analysis to understand where your hand's value comes from and why the solver might prefer putting certain cards in some lines and certain cards in other lines. Okay, for our second example, I have chosen a cutoff versus big blind single raise pot, king seven six rainbow. Checks the cutoff, who bets half pot. And this is a reasonable size. We can see that they're doing this with a good portion of their range. Actions on us in the big blind. Now again, for this technique to work, you really need to focus in on one card before you try and extrapolate anything. And I've chosen ace eight suited. Why have I chosen this hand? Well, because it's kind of interesting. It's check raising almost half the time here, right? So how does ace eight of diamonds actually make money through a check raise line? Let's take a look. So we'll raise, cut off calls, and let's go take a look at these turn reports. Now, again, what you want to do is select expected value. This is big blinds expected value. And filter for the hand that you want to mess with. Okay. And you know what? Let's simplify this further for a second. I'm going to sort by cards here. So this represents all the two turns, three turns, four turns, five turns, and so on. And we can see that some cards have greater EV. Obviously, hitting an ace is fantastic. We just made top pair. We just outdrew villain's top pair. What about an eight, though? We check raise ace eight suited. We hit an eight. No, this is one of the worst possible turns for us. We would rather have a brick. The reason is that we didn't check raise this hand to try and make second pair. We didn't check raise an eight to try and hit an eight. We check raised it because we wanted to hit a draw. We wanted to hit an open ender, a gut shot. We wanted to hit, for example, a backdoor flush draw. These are where our hand actually makes money. Backdoor flush draws turns that give us some straight draw potential or hitting an ace. When you check raise, you're essentially saying to your opponent that you are wanting to play for stacks. You're representing a very polarized range that's ready to play aggressively on a lot of runouts. So you don't really want to flop a bunch of medium strength hands here. All right, let's take a look at aces here. We check raise, we hit top pair. What does our strategy look like? Well, notice that we're mostly just checking on an ace, right? This is the highest EV turn card for us. And yet we're mostly just checking. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. The highest EV turn card is not the one you should be the most aggressive on. The ones you should be the most aggressive on, in a check raise line anyway, 
are the boards where you can build a pot, are the boards where you can potentially draw to the nuts and outdraw the top of your opponent's range. Backdoor diamonds, backdoor straights, and such. And so it's important to recognize where this EV comes from before you start playing a check raise with ace eight. Because if you don't know what cards you're supposed to barrel with, if you don't understand the idea that you're playing for a polarized equity, well, then you probably don't really understand how to play this spot. And if you check raise it anyway, you're just going to set money on fire, right? So this is why it's really important to think about how does my hand generate money? Now we can extrapolate this further. Uh, for example, take a look at ace five here. This one's check raising a bunch. Seems like a weird check raise, but I guarantee you it's the same heuristic. You're check raising here because the five connects with the six and the seven, because the spade connects with the king of spades. Uh, so you can hit that backdoor flush draw, those backdoor straight draws, and you're going to see this heuristic come up a ton, right? So anyway, hopefully that makes sense. For this next example, I've chosen a button versus big blind single race pot on ace seven six rainbow. Checks to us on the button, and we've got an interesting mixed strategy going on. Now one hand that sticks out to me in particular is king queen, both offsuit and suited. We notice that these King X hands are checking back a lot. What is that? Well, first of all, you know, it's a medium strength hand, but there's more to it than that. What happens if we bet? I think a lot of players just by habit would range bet this board, but what does King Queen actually gain by betting? Uh, well, first of all, you fold out a whole lot of these King X and Queen X hands, and I would ask the viewer, is this a good thing? Do you want to fold out these hands? Probably not, right? Why do you want to fold out the very hands you dominate? Imagine you hit a king or a queen, you can extract value from these hands. Uh, secondly, you, you just hard block the folding range, so you don't get nearly enough fold equity. But okay, let's challenge this assumption. What happens if we check back? How does our hand actually make money in the checking line? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a button check, and again, we're going to go to turn reports. So I'll say big blind checks. And again, let's apply a filter for, let's say, King Queen of Clubs. No backdoor flush draw equity on King Queen of Clubs. Okay, so here I'm showing the expected value of the button across all the turn cards. And obviously, you know, a king or a queen are going to be high. And stuff that gives us a draw, like a 10 or a jack, also decent cards. Something else to realize is that a 6 or a 7, any board pairing card, actually pretty good for king queen and the reason for this is simpler than you might imagine it's just that we were already beaten by a six a seven or an ace so when that pairs it just reduces the amount of combinations our opponent can have and doesn't add an extra board card that our opponent can connect with so we reduce the number of combos that already beat us and don't add any more cards that can potentially now beat us so board pairing cards draw completing cards or draw giving cards, obviously a king or a queen, and some bricks at the bottom. Now, what cards do we really hate to see? Stuff that adds more draws or connects with the middle of the range. So a four, a five, eight or a nine, all of these cards connect with this seven and the six, uh, which is going to benefit big blinds range quite a bit. And these are not the type of cards we want. So these are the lowest EV cards. Okay, let's compare this to the strategy. So I want you guys to take a moment and think, do you think we bet more on a king, a queen, or some other card? Which turn card should we delay c-bet the most often? Take a moment to consider your answer. King, queen, or something else. Let's take a look at the strategy. Again, I'm filtering for king, queen of clubs here. On the turn. And the answer is a jack. <laughs> we barrel most often on a jack, right? And this is because, okay, yeah, we're barreling on a king, but it's it's like a really small size. We're, you know, overbetting on a jack. A lot more money goes in on some of these draw completing cards. So tenor jack comes in. These are the type of turns that give us polarized equity. These are the type of turn cards that mean we now have the option to start playing for big stacks. We can't do that on, for example, a queen or a king because... We have second pair. You don't play for stacks with second pair, right? Maybe you can bet for thin value, but you certainly don't overbet. So the highest EV turn card 
is not the turn card that you want to bet most often. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, given that we're checking back the turn 95% of the time, what was the point of checking flop? Well, now we need to examine this a bit more deeply. Let's choose a brick, just for fairness sake. I'm going to select this card. This is uh, the deuce of whatever. The deuce of brick. And you can see here that big blind, they're going to check a lot on most turn cards. Checks to us, and we can see king queen is pure checking, right? So we're not checking... We're pure checking flop, we're pure checking turn. How does our hand actually make money then? Okay, well, let's just go to some random river card. Eight is not a great card for us, by the way. I chose that at random. Let's say that it checks to us. We're checking down. King queen is a fine hand to check down, right? 50% equity here. What are you talking about? That's great. And let's say that, for example, we face a block bet. King queen is now indifferent but we can still bluff catch. Okay, what happens on, for example, a queen? So let's say it's a queen, it checks. We can now go for some thin value with our king-queen suited. And what happens, for example, if we now face some bet size? I'm going to choose 73% here. Well, now we can pick off a bunch of bluffs. Great. So king-queen is going to generate most of its money by just checking down, to be honest. In the vast majority of lines, king-queen offsuit on this type of board will check down. So why did we want to check back the flop in the first place? It's because there's already an ace on the board. When we bet, we're not folding an ace. There's no other over cards to fold out, right? So what was the purpose of trying to bet a hand like king-queen suited, other than to fold out hands you already dominate uh, and get called by better, right? Instead, take this medium strength hand and check it down. And the way we discovered that was through simple turn reports. All right, that was a lot to take in, but hopefully you guys got something from it. If you have any questions or need something clarified, please feel free to ask questions in our Discord server, link in the description. It's a great community and a great place to ask questions. Anyway, that's my video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. And as always, happy grinding.